In introducing, uh, introducing our guest, um, I, I decided that I wanted to see how many books are published in a given year in the United States of America. And the answer is a staggering, staggering sum, 3.1 billion, billion books. That's a lot of books. And when you go back through the history of books, and um, let us now praise famous men, which became one of the American classics when it was originally published, was only 200 copies sold. The average book of poetry sells less than 1,000 copies. And so I mention that because when you think about our guest, this uh, uh, University of Virginia, Yale, University, when you think about the book that he wrote, The Death of Common Sense, and the, and, the, and the very great effect that that book has had, and to somehow break through uh, all of the other books that are published, and to, to write a book that people still talk about, still reference, and still think was hugely important is no small achievement. It's a great honor to welcome to the City Club and to San Diego, the one and the only Philip K. Howard. Thank you, George. It's nice to be back in San Diego. Thanks for having me, and it's an honor to have Mr. Williams here to listen to what I have to say. Um, it's a slightly, uh, slightly gloomy topic, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, try to answer the question whether democracy is killing itself. And I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, I think it has a solution as well. And the solution is, goes back to the basic American values of responsibility. But, but to get to that solution, we're going to have a historic overhaul of government. It's going to happen not because I and the people that I'm gathering together are going to make it happen. It will happen because we have a crisis, which we're cruising towards because we have unsustainable trillion dollar deficits in this country and comparable deficits in states such as California. <coughs> but it will, it will be not unlike changes that have occurred three times in the last century. Uh, in the progressive movement, worked very hard for decades until the event of Upton Sinclair's book caused there to be a dramatic shift in our social same frame of reference and we got rid of the doctrine of laissez-faire, that you had to trust people to not mangle children or create pure drugs and such. We needed regulation to make sure people did the right thing. That was a major shift. The New Deal, we got to social safety nets, which was a completely new idea. Government was not supposed to take care of people in a free society, but we realized that the economy was beyond people's control. And when global forces led to starvation, the government couldn't just sit there. We had to take care of people, and we got the New Deal, and that was vital. And then in the 60s, we woke up to all of these abuses of racism, gender discrimination, pollution. We had to change our social frame of reference. We are at that point in America again. Things are not working. And what's not working, I think, is very fundamental. I, don't, I probably don't have to convince you that government is broken. You live in California. <laughs> you, see, you see the brokenness in action every day. But most people still think that, oh, if only we had a new leader, or if only pol the political parties were less polarized, that somehow things would work better. And I believe all those are just symptoms of a deeper flaw in modern democracy. And the flaw is this. We've lost the capacity for people to take responsibility. It is literally illegal if you have some position of responsibility, to act on your best judgment. It's, this has occurred almost without our noticing it by the steady accretion of law, regulation, rights to sue, and such that have steadily built up over the last few decades like sediment in the harbor until we're at a point where it's almost impossible to do anything. I'll just give a few examples, starting at the top. In 2010, 70% of all federal revenue 
was consumed by three entitlement programs that don't even come up for annual authorization. It's just an automatic pilot. That's where all the money went, or almost all the money, just those three programs. They're important programs, but there are other important things that government does, does as well. Something similar has happened to state budgets. Governors come into office, and most of the obligations are set forth in, in uh, statutes that were passed decades ago by uh, union contracts, by federal mandates that the governor can't do anything about. When, when Andrew Cuomo became governor of the state of New York two years ago, he discovered that there was a 50, uh, a juvenile detention facility that had no juveniles in it. It cost $50 million a year to run. He said, well, that's one way to save $50 million of taxpayer revenue. We'll just close down the facility. He wasn't allowed to. It turns out that there was a statute that said before closing any facility with union employees, you have to give at least one year's notice. It's a law on the books. He couldn't do anything about it. So another 50, year, another 50 million dollars goes down the drain because of some obscure statute that someone passed a while back. Ministerial decisions are almost impossible. At one point, Obama in his State of the Union speech said, there's no reason Europe or China should have the fastest trains. Well, yes, there is. The environmental review process has turned into uh, a um, process of no pebble left unturned that often goes on for as long as a decade, followed by years of litigation. He tried to stimulate the economy with shovel-ready projects. He finally admitted a year later there was no such thing as a shovel-ready project. The President of the United States doesn't have the authority to say, after, say, a year of review, this is a good project. I was elected to make these kinds of decisions. Let's go forward with it. He lacks that authority because the law doesn't let him make the authority. We don't think, uh, we don't think of schools as a legal problem, but teachers and principals are crushed by law. You could have an entire section of a law library filled with laws about no child left behind, special education, due process, zero tolerance, work rules, tenure. People who run schools go through the day basically managing the law. You think about what's the school supposed to be? It's supposed to be about humans interacting with students and getting them excited and, and uh, teachers maintaining control of the classroom. and, and Instead, every time you want to dismiss a disruptive kid of the classroom so the other 28 kids can learn, you've got to fill out forms and risk a, 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 a legal hearing. And the result of that, and there have been studies of this, is that teachers have lost control of the classroom because, because of the law. It comes down to the most basic common sense decisions can't even be made anymore. It's really uh, amazing. There, there, this, this, this rash of incidents where young children get led away from school in handcuffs. We're talking about five-year-olds, six-year-olds, because the rule is you're not allowed to actually touch a child, because someone might claim it was an unwanted touching. So if some kid has, you know, uh, has an emotional problem or goes crazy, they call the police. This happens. I've got dozens of these stories, and the police have a procedure of putting the children in handcuffs. You just think about the sickness of a society that would, that, that would do that. The, there was an incident this, this winter in New Jersey where a tree fell in a creek in town, Franklin Township, New Jersey. And so the, it was causing flooding. And um, so they were going to send in a backhoe to, to pull the tree out of the creek. And then the lawyer for the town discovered that there was actually a procedure they had to follow because this was a Class C1 creek, whatever that means. And so 12 days later and $25,000 worth of legal process, they got approval to finally end the flooding and pull the tree out of the creek. About the same time in New Jersey, uh, it came to light that a church that had a uh, soup <coughs> kitchen fed 200 people a day, uh, they have been doing this for 30 years, someone discovered that there was a law that required 
all food in public facilities be inspected by the health inspector. And the way this facility worked is that the parishioners brought in food from their homes. And so the, the state told the church they had to shut down the program or build a new kitchen and make all the law on premises. They'd never had an incident. 200 meals a day at no cost to the state. So the church was trying to raise $150,000 to build a kitchen in the basement of the church and have people come build it. But that's just a waste of money. So people aren't allowed to do things their own way. If you want to start a business, some of you may have done that, it's basically impossible to start a business and comply with all the law. You couldn't know what it was. You couldn't afford the lawyer to tell you what it was. In New York City, to start a restaurant, you have to get approval of nine different agencies. Now, I'm not against regulation. I think it's really important to have regulations that restaurants don't pour grease down the drains and have sanitary kitchens. So I think it's really important to have government oversight of restaurants. But nine different agencies? Surely government could work a little better and give someone authority to go in and figure out how, the, how, it, how it could happen a little more efficiently so that people who want to go and do business in America can get, get started and move along. But no one has that responsibility. So you ask yourself, who is actually running democracy? And the answer is nobody. Corporations. No, nobody. Corporations are, are, are of significant influence, and we can talk about special interests, which are really insidious. But democracy is run by the dead people who wrote all these rules and regulations that have just piled up over the years, and nobody goes and cleans them out. And so whoever you elect doesn't really matter. They can do some things, and they can, be, they can do more on a local level than they can at the state level, and do more on the state level than they can on the federal level, but basically, government is run by what's been left over by all of these decades of accumulated political deals and good ideas and bad ideas and backroom deals with special interests. It's all piled up to the point where we have a legal code. The federal legal code is 140 million words and counting. Nobody knows it all. Billions of federal, of, of state and local law, billions of words. And they embody things like subsi farm subsidies from the New Deal. The crisis ended in 1941, and we're still spending $15 billion a year to subsidize, at this point, corporate farmers. And nobody can get rid of it. So we have this pile up of law. So why is that? Why has this problem occurred? Why do we have this giant blob that's kind of running so that you can't do anything? And there are two problems. And the problem is not, well, first Congress and state legislatures have the power to change the law. They could come into session and change the law. So why don't they do it? There are two reasons. One is that they don't have the idea. Everyone treats law like it's permanent. Once it's a law, it's a law. So people think that law is like the Ten Commandments, except it's become the Ten Million Commandments at this point. And the second problem is a structural problem with our Constitution. Our founders made it hard to pass laws with checks and balances. And the theory was they would preserve the field of freedom by making it very hard for legislatures to, to interpose and make new laws. And so that way, you, you would only get the laws that you really needed. And that worked to a certain extent. But 200 years later, the field of freedom is now basically a legal minefield. It's just filled up with laws. I mean, you know, it's just, you know, and it's, it's the same process to get rid of a law as to pass it in the first place, except that it turns out to be exponentially harder. Because once the law is passed, it has an army of special interests surrounding it, corporations and others. And if you want to change one word of any statute, you have to get a majority of the legislature to run a gauntlet of special interests beating you on the head with money, and if you don't go along with them, they'll spend the money on your opponent. And so as a result, we have a culture in Washington where everyone in Washington now assumes that you can never get rid of or clean out an old law because no one ever does it. And it just hasn't happened in, in our lifetime. So what's the solution? We have this situation where the law is piled up.